right. I guess good morning, everybody. I don't think I've met everybody that's on the Zoom. Um, I'm one of the PGY4 cardiology residents. And we're going to review today and try to keep things pretty uh, simple and straightforward, the role of echocardiography for uh, thoracic aortic disease uh, and touch all on the kind of main pertinent points. Um, of course, I don't have any disclosures. I have broken things down in terms of these four learning objectives, and we're going to cover each one um, in sequence. So first, we're going to define the normal aortic dimensions and measure um, standards by echocardiography, uh, measurement standards by echocardiography. We'll discuss the role of echocardiography in detecting th uh, thoracic aortic disease or acute aortic syndromes. And then with that, we'll identify any kind of a main associated findings of acute aortic uh, syndromes using echocardiography. And then finally, we'll just kind of go through the, the guidelines for follow-up surveillance um, and monitoring of thoracic aortic disease. With that, um, just the main references, I've basically drawn everything from the main guidelines when it comes to the new 2022 aortic guidelines from the AHA and then the ASC um, um, review uh, articles in terms of aortic imaging, uh, the ESC uh, guidelines, uh, as well as some good um, state-of-the-art uh, review uh, articles um, as well. And so all of the references are, are from these um, main titles, including all of the figures and tables. So to get started, um, I do have a few questions uh, to go through as we go through the presentation. Um, if we could include that uh, and just put your answer into the chat or, or unmute your mic and, and, and speak up would be, um, would be great for your participation. Uh, and that will keep uh, things moving well and hopefully uh, a little bit more interactive than just uh, over Zoom. So first things first, uh, we're going to first focus on aortic dimensions and measurement standards uh, by ECHO. So just starting off with the question, uh, at what aortic size would one consider a patient to have an aortic aneurysm? Uh, so there's five answer choices here. If you don't mind just throwing uh, answers in the chat to show some participation, otherwise just think about it on your own and discuss amongst yourselves. And I'll give you 15, 20 seconds and then we'll keep moving on. All right, so the answer, let's see. So aortic aneurysm, so I guess we're really focusing on, good question, Ryan, let's say oh yeah, aortic root uh, or ascending aorta. It is sort of loosely defined. All right, so lots of different answers. Uh, so the answer is actually C, uh, based on the new aortic uh, guidelines, and we'll get into uh, why that definition is as such, uh, but the standard now definition is 4.5 uh, centimeters. So just a very brief um, review, of course. What we have here is we've got the uh, regular aorta. We're going to be focusing on the ascending aorta today and in the thorax uh, with more particular attention to the aortic root and uh, ascending aorta. Uh, there's a little bit uh, less information I'm going to focus on in terms of the descending aorta because it's not as relevant in terms of what we see in terms of our practice, um, in, in terms of using for echo, uh, and then we're not going to be talking about the abdominal aorta today. So this is the same kind of anatomy, just looked in the uh, substantial notch view um, with the transthoracic. We've got the aortic arch here, descending aorta, the arch, uh, the descending, um, with the takeoffs in terms of the uh, branches off the uh, aortic arch. When it comes to the dimensions, it really depends, as Ryan already had said, in terms of where we're measuring uh, from. And there's a, bunch of, a number of standard areas when it comes to the thoracic aorta that we use our um, uh, measurements and assessments. And this is on this diagram here. So the first is the aortic annulus um, that we can me uh, measure. And this is kind of at the level uh, of the semilunar uh, leaflets uh, from the aortic valve uh, with the standard measurements that they include here. Um, for, for, uh, for males. And then most of the time we're, we're measuring at the sinus of Valsava uh, on personal law access, which I'll get into um, with, with ranges given as such here. Uh, 
we can move up to the sinotubular junction where we're no longer in the sinuses. And as we move up, uh, just proximal to the innominate artery or to that uh, right uh, brachiosaurus to take off, we have the uh, aortic arch measurements here. And again, kind of at the ligamentum uh, arteriosum um, a remnant as well, distally, just distal to the left subclavian artery. Uh, and then further measurements if we're using TE, uh, TE can be done by the descending aorta. When it comes to the normal aortic root diameters, um, and these are just absolute numbers, uh, we have for men and for women on, on the right. Essentially, it comes down to two things. One is that these are uh, averages, first and foremost by uh, sex, and then second by age, uh, as over time, our um, aortic root and ascending aorta will enlarge um, uh, just marginally, and we have to take that in account when it comes to measurements and to so what is normal. And of course, there's the caveat in terms of what body surface area is, and there's these additions that we need to know for basically for patients who are much larger with a body surface area of greater than two, mil, um, two uh, meters squared, uh, but I'll get into more details of what that is uh, in just a moment. But essentially for the average person, if they're 50, uh, for a woman, we're thinking about 3.2 centimeters, for a man around 3.6. Uh, so all of these numbers that you can see are under four. For females, they're all under 3.5. Uh, generally speaking, from a mean, uh, and for men, they're all under four. In the aorta uh, 2022 HA guidelines, the normal is considered less than 3.4, uh, just arbitrarily. A dilated aorta, now the, now the standard nomenclature is any uh, in measurement within the thorax of the aorta measuring four to 4.4 centimeters. Anything measuring greater than 4.5 centimeters is considered now aneurysm. And now they've uh, advised to remove the term ectatic or ectasia to explain uh, any kind of terms in terms of dilatation uh, as it's not specific and it's kind of used very loosely. A lot of these, uh, this definition comes from studies from the, from the um, MESA um, cohorts and database as well as patients with bicuspid aortic valves who had surgery and then are followed up. Um, and essentially the reason why 4.5 was chosen as the definition for aneurysm is because 4.5 and greater, the relative risk of, of spontaneous rupture increases 6,000 fold. Uh, so that is significant enough that that becomes a, something that we need to closely monitor. And having a definition of aneurysm is more striking than saying just that the aorta is dilated or that there's ectasia. We do want to know that after four, there's also an increased relative risk of about 90, which is still significant if we compare it to somebody who's normal. Um, and, and that's why routine surveillance uh, and, and routine measurement and, and looking at um, aortic size is important for, for preventing uh, these types of catastrophic uh, injuries that can occur. Well, let's hopefully these videos will play, um, but just demonstrating to you just on a very simple um, personal long axis, a very dilated, um, or what would one would call, you know, a moderate, severely dilated uh, aortic root, but this should be classified as aneurysm. Uh, if it's measured, it's, it's, it's about five centimeters. Now getting in terms of normalization, because there's a lot of people with different sizes and how that factors in, Essentially, in a historically body surface area, and that's still covered a bit in the guidelines in terms of when we use this terminology, uh, but essentially indexing it to body surface area, and that can accommodate for people who are much larger or much smaller, uh, and what that normal is. However, a lot of um, cohorts and, and, and data that the guidelines had uh, put together had found that weight doesn't play as much a role as, as we believe uh, in terms of what the actual measurements are. And that instead we should be using the cross-sectional area to height ratio as a more accurate measure um, and has been better well validated uh, that a cross-sectional area to height ratio of greater than 10 centimeters squared per meter has a, um, a better correlation with predicting patients who are at higher risk of uh, aortic, uh, acute aortic syndrome or aortic rupture. Um, and, and that's uh, kind of going away that we no longer really need to calculate a Z, a Z score uh, for these patients to index a body surface area. That instead it should be much easier for cross-sectional area to height ratio. And if it's greater than 10, 
it's most of the time it's a class one or a 2A recommendation for a referral to surgery. Uh, second question here. So what is the standard for measuring the uh, aortic root diameter on transthoracic echo? Uh, and I need you to choose an answer from each of the columns. Um, as you can see, they're both uh, kind of related to each other. I'm not sure what happened to my chat here. There it is. Chat box. And then while I was thinking about that, I know Patrick didn't mention the 1.5 times uh, uh, normal. That is used and mentioned. Unfortunately, if that's a use for men, it leads to a, a, a definition of aneurysm of 5.2 centimeters, which is, is, which is far too large. Uh, thanks for, for chipping in. Um, a lot of people are saying B3. Lots of different answers. So the ASC uh, has a standard definition of measuring the aortic root, actually end diastole, um, leading edge to leading edge. Uh, and we'll kind of get into that, uh, but that's uh, essentially what they, uh, what they describe as having the largest uh, diameter and not affected by uh, systole uh, in terms of blood flow through there. And this is important as we'll get into and as we know, this is, replica, is ensuring that our measurements replicate uh, one another and that there's standardization, particularly where there can be a lot of changes, especially with using uh, echo uh, in terms of both uh, the views that are obtained uh, as this can affect uh, management and uh, surveillance over time. So measurement standards uh, for the era were all developed using uh, transocular or transesophageal echo and then adapted to using MRI and CT, which is now used you know, more commonly for really assessing the true anatomy. So a lot of the studies in terms of what defines a dilatation versus aneurysm versus what the risk for rupture is all based on echo measurements. Um, and that's why we need to have important standards to measure. So when it comes to the ascending aorta, the, again, I mentioned that there's a number of areas where we can measure. We always have to ensure that we're perpendicular to this long axis so that we're not, um, creating that cylindrical effect or creating a larger cross-sectional diameter if we're not completely perpendicular uh, to the tube. Uh, essentially, the sinotubular junction or the aortic group is the standard where we measure most of our time and then the mid-ascending uh, mid aorta as well. Again, it's end diastole from leading edge, which means basically the first um, layer that we see, so not the inside, but the first layer that we see on the parasitic long axis uh, traditionally to the next leading edge, which again would be that anterior layer. Now this is the inner edge of that um, bottom uh, wall. So the anterior wall, we use the, just the anterior edge and then the anterior edge of the posterior wall. When it comes to CT or if we do anything on the short axis, interestingly enough, we can measure things from sinus to sinus or from uh, sinus to commissure. And there's actually no standard in terms of one over the other. Both can be used in sinus and sinus, of course, will lead to a larger measurement, but it is permissible in terms of particularly even counting the cross-sectional surface area to height ratio for determining uh, severity and standardization. When it comes to MRI and CT, we actually use just inner edge to inner edge uh, rather than the leading edge to leading edge. At the same time, uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're cutting the, the cylinder and the aorta uh, appropriately, both perpendicularly in the, uh, in the long axis, across in the short axis, uh, to ensure that we're not uh, getting a larger measurement uh, or a peculiar measurement uh, one time or another. One uh, for one that can lead to people getting a uh, incorrect diagnosis, or it could mean um, errors in terms of their surveillance and follow up. Again, CT or MRI, this is more of the time when we're using the sinus to sinus or commissure to sinus. Uh, it's important for cross-sectional surface area, but again, both can be used. And of course, both lead to different uh, uh, measured values. And again, it's inner edge to inner edge. So knowing that the difference when it comes to measuring um, aortic root sizes or uh, uh, thoracic uh, aortic sizes will be different on, on echo versus uh, CT or MRI imaging, just because of there's a difference in terms of definition, in terms of what is used. But at the same time, all of the standards of definition in terms of what's relayed in terms of referral for surgery, consideration uh, for more closer monitoring is all based on echo um, data 
In terms of the views, we're all very familiar with the standard views for echo, and this is on for transthoracic uh, on the top and transesophageal on the bottom. And with respect to that, uh, we can see that there's different parts of the aorta that we can uh, assess. Traditionally, the peristernal long axis, we can assess the uh, uh, ascending uh, uh, aortic root, the ascending aorta very well. Um, and sometimes we can also, and we also see a, a, an aspect of the descending uh, thoracic aorta coming uh, kind of posterior to the left atrium. In our apical views, oftentimes we can find the descending uh, thoracic aorta depending on uh, where we tilt our probe. And then of course the suprasternal view uh, where we really do see the arch and can see both the ascending and descending in some patients. The subcostal can help us sometimes to see the ascending thoracic aorta uh, when it leads uh, from, the aortic, uh, from the aortic valve. Transesophageal will touch on briefly today, but of course it's very good for viewing uh, the aorta. You can see both the ascending uh, aorta and the uh, descending thoracic aorta and the arch, uh, both in long and short axes. These are the standard views from the ASC in terms of uh, what I had just discussed, both with the diagram here and what the echo findings are and what we're actually gonna be looking at in terms of those chambers. I think this is more straightforward enough uh, for where we're at, but this is just showing where those standards are because they are important again for ensuring that we have reproducible um, and accurate measurements. And these are our short axis views, less used in terms of measuring uh, aortic size. We usually just use our long axis views, but they can be just the same. Again, even on echo, we can do sinus to sinus measurements or a commissure to sinus. And that again can help with the cross-sectional surface area uh, assumptions and uh, this, the now new kind of uh, protocol that we should be using for, for standardizing and indexing these uh, measurements. The aortic arch, as we've reviewed before. Uh, on TEE, uh, again, we can visualize the aorta very well. These are the standard views. Um, and just for time's sake, I'll just uh, leave it at, at that. Uh, but again, we can have good views of both the aorta and short axis, which we do when we often come out at the end of a transesophageal uh, echo study. Uh, and then depending on uh, where we can uh, rotate um, uh, and place the transducer angle, we can see uh, different views uh, of the aorta and have very sensitive measurements uh, to that. And this is just a final review with a diagram, both of, of uh, traditional trans uh, like echo, as well as the uh, animation, just showing again, the standards for, for how we measure to ensure that it's perpendicular, it's from leading edge to leading edge, uh, and this is a measurement of across the um, sinus of El Saba of the aortic root. Uh, here would be the uh, sinus tubular junction, if you can, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, uh, and then higher up would be up to the ascending aorta. And this is just a review again. So we've just completed that uh, learning and Jack, we're gonna move on to discuss the world of echo uh, in detecting thoracic disease and acute aortic syndrome. So we've got another question here. And if anybody can chime in in terms of what uh, finding is demonstrated in the clip. So this is without measurements. It's a transesophageal study. Um, So if we have no takers, this is going to be a, this is, like this is a dilated uh, aortic annulus with a stretched out uh, aortic valve leaflets. Uh, and this is not a traditional view that we use to measure, but it can be well measured. And again, as Dr. Chow said, uh, yeah, exactly, Patrick, it's this aortic root dilatation. Um, and then this will, measuring across this uh, cross-sectional uh, area here on the short axis will better correlate with a CTR MRI. So getting into aortic disease, there's a lot of different imaging modalities that we can use. Of course, today we're focusing on the transthoracic and TDE, uh, but again, we wanna really compare and contrast what the different uh, options are and why would you, we use one over the other. Yes, traditionally it's easy to get CTs or uh, MRI scans, but uh, echoes are done quite frequently, are very portable with, and most importantly also have very good temporal resolution compared to all the other studies. Um, in addition to that, particularly when it comes to aortic root, we can evaluate the uh, aortic valve and other valves uh, and, and uh, ventricular function, uh, unlike uh, CT, and, but MRI to some degree, 
And that is very important in terms of uh, determining sometimes some complications that can happen, say from uh, type A dissections. Again, these are advantages. Uh, mostly again, we're looking at LV function and we can look at aortic regurgitation, uh, very accessible and very portable. Um, and that uh, can be used you know, very readily for both family screening, for looking at the aortic root uh, and reproducibility of, of measurements if done in a standardized fashion. And this is just a summary of what the AHA uh, guidelines uh, demonstrate in terms of techniques uh, to determine the presence of uh, aortic disease. Uh, and these are mostly the class one and two A recommendations of uh, basically everything that we just outlined uh, so far in terms of the standardized uh, measurements uh, and, and the best way to do that. Now getting into actual diseases of the aorta, the first is aortic atherosclerosis. And interestingly enough, the guidelines mentioned that transesophageal echoes are first line uh, or the, the best modality for assessing aortic atherosclerotic disease. The image of this is given the high resolution that we can get of the aortic intima and luminal interface. Uh, it's very reproducible. Uh, and it's uh, easy also to detect our throma, uh, the size, mobility, and get the temporal resolution as well. Sometimes there's some distortion uh, and artifact, and often sometimes uh, given the fact uh, of the, uh, the probe being parallel, uh, you might not be able to look at a Doppler as well. Now the goal, uh, and this is mostly for anyone who's evaluating aortic disease, both on uh, traditional CT imaging, but also for echo, we should always just keep in the back of our mind that there's a number of steps in terms of things that we should always think about. First and foremost is confirming the diagnosis, and that's why we went through uh, the standard definitions and measurements. Uh, so first we confirm the diagnosis. Um, we ensure we get good measurements uh, and we add different appropriate planes uh, and, and views. And then always looking at, again, at the LV function, looking at the aortic valve, most importantly, looking at the arch and other vessels, and then assessing for any complications such as thrombus, dissection, or any hematoma or leak. Here's an example of aortic atherosclerosis on TE. Uh, and you can see that you can see the intimal layers very well uh, and a variety of different scenarios in terms of mild kind of plaque inverted disease uh, to more severe uh, plaque that with the developed thickness and we can measure that as well. Eric atherosclerosis can be graded. I'm not gonna go into details, uh, but in terms of it uh, relates to the thickness of the intima, and then it becomes much larger in terms of when it's moderate, we have seen polythroma. And then when that gets larger, uh, we begin to then have a much higher grading scale. Uh, most importantly, we have acute aortic syndromes. And I got another question. So here's another echo clip. I hope this is uh, straightforward for everyone. Yes, it is big trouble. So he has a dissection um, of the aortic root. And you can see that's also would be very, very close to the Ostium of the, particularly the right um, coronary artery. So this would be in big trouble both for uh, obstructive uh, osteal disease from the dissection flap, but also of the infiltrating the entire uh, kind of annulus. So we want to be able to pick this up, not just on a transthoracic study. In terms of aortic syndromes, I used to use AAS uh, going through for the rest of the presentation. We have dissection uh, where we get that penetrating a medial flap that leads to a false lumen and it continues to separate into the media. We see that there's intramural hematoma where slowly that there's a bleed into that uh, layer, but that usually expands outwards. So it doesn't really affect the true lumen uh, at all. And then we have penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. And that's where we have this, uh, you know, also that will have this a bit of a, a leak um, that can usually form thrombus uh, too and that will feed the rest and possibly extend it for your dissection. We were very familiar with what the categorization for aortic dissections, type A and type B. Um, we we're more concerned about type A dissections primarily, given that we're dealing with around the heart uh, and, and the ascending aortic root. Uh, 
uh, as demonstrated before, is just another diagram to see um, on transthoracic that we can pick up uh, type A dissections quite readily in terms of seeing that uh, flap on just uh, just distal to the uh, aortic valves. Another question was the estimated sensitivity for TE for diagnosing acute thoracic aortic dissection. To see where everybody kind of estimates. I was a little bit, well, I was a little surprised by this. And, All right, thanks for everybody's participation. It's actually 88%, so it's almost 90%, which is uh, much higher than I anticipated. Again, most of the time we're not using TE as the, as the primary diagnostic tool when somebody has a clinical suspicion for thoracic aortic dissection, but it can be readily used and it's often used now in even recess settings in emergency departments or critical care settings. And that's oftentimes how they can pick it up. Uh, this is a big chart here that kind of goes through the choices for aortic dissection in terms of imaging modality, focusing on to uh, TEE, which is a first or second line uh, modality, uh, along with CT scan. Um, and it has very high diagnostic accuracy because we have very good images, again, of the internal layers of the ascending and descending. Uh, um, and as, as Dr. Liam Poy said, yeah, before they had CT, TE was the go-to. And that's why, it, even though maybe not as readily used uh, frequently, but uh, is just as uh, well supported in terms of the evidence uh, behind it. Um, of course, there's some operator de dependence uh, and reverberation artifact that uh, one must uh, take into account. But uh, overall, uh, it is a very good modality. Sometimes we do pick this up on transthoracic uh, echo, particularly even more, uh, more so now that we have bedside ultrasound where we can assess patients at the bedside um, who come in with possible chest trauma or with uh, chest pain. And that's often used in the emergency departments now and has uh, from time to time picked up uh, uh, acute dissections. And just here's where the evidence was coming from. Most of the studies from uh, Mass General um, Hospital that looked at this and compared these different modalities. And again, these are in the ASC uh, guidelines. And this is just more of a, a chart uh, outlining uh, the similar uh, features of that. Again, the sensitivity between CTATE and MRA is essentially equivalent. Um, and readily available, and it also has good specificity as well. And then comparing, as we did before, in terms of this time, say just looking at aortic disease, but looking at dissection, particularly what, why would we choose one over the other, and what are the risks and benefits? Uh, the fact that you know TTE and TE have no ionizing radiation or contrast, and they can be performed at the bedside or quickly performed, uh, makes them something that is also both cost effective and uh, easy to use, particularly in somebody who's, who's well-trained. This is just an imaging algorithm, as we see for uh, acute aortic syndromes like dissection. Again, often now we see people going for CT, but transthoracic echo, sometimes it's picked up incidentally, sometimes on just bedside ultrasound, or sometimes if somebody's sent with chest pain to get uh, an echo in the lab, they can have these findings. And then from there, Oftentimes, we end up getting a CT regardless to look at the rest of the chest anatomy uh, and other vessels uh, before continuing uh, usually to surgery or to an uh, operative care. Going now to our third uh, of four learning objectives, uh, taking from what uh, we've just reviewed from uh, acute aortic syndrome, we're now going to kind of review the main findings on echo uh, for uh, AAS. This is a main chart that was a good review uh, here. That we're just going to go through in terms of the echo evaluation for aortic uh, dissection. So the first is, uh, and foremost, is often identifying the presence of a dissection flap, and people use that uh, probably most obviously for particularly at the bedside if doing a TTE uh, with the focus machine. And we really want to find that flap that divides into two lumens, both the true and the false lumen. From there, if we do identify the presence of a dissection flap, we then need to define how far that dissection flap goes, which sometimes we're not able to completely do. But if we're in the middle of a TE study, we can usually go down the descending uh, uh, thoracic aorta and continue uh, to try to develop images. Um, 
this is important uh, and usually best better assessed with the CT scan, but can be helpful uh, in terms of how we evaluate things. The second would be then identifying what the true lumen is and identify the false lumen. And there's a number of markers, uh, which I can go into a little bit more detail a little bit later in terms of um, differentiating the true versus false lumen on echocardiography. Um, other things to note is, is trying to localize the entry of the tear. Again, from the previous uh, image that I had showed you before, um, assessing kind of any coronary artery uh, involvement as, as that can be uh, catastrophic. Um, and other things that we often can pick up, uh, the presence of a new pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade and the context of type A dissection um, or uh, evaluate LV function uh, and the aortic valve, of course. This is a similar type uh, table. Again, same type of process and, and same information, but just from the two uh, separate guidelines. But again, to know that really it comes down to identifying the presence of a flap, it's defining how long the dissection flap uh, runs, identifying what the true lumen is compared to the false lumen, uh, and then trying to localize where that tear comes from, assess the LV function and uh, any aortic regurgitation, assess for complications such as coronary artery involvement, any side branches, or any pericardial uh, fusions or tamponade. Going on to another question now, what features on echo can help us differentiate a true lumen from a false lumen uh, for when it comes to thoracic aortic dissection? So A, is, is a true lumen usually larger than the false lumen or vice versa? Um, there's systolic expansion of the true lumen and then syst uh, and systolic compression of the false lumen. Or is it echo contrast is early fast in the false lumen, or the true lumen develops retrograde flow? Thanks, Shane. Yeah, so B is the answer. Um, when it comes to differentiating the true, this is kind of important in terms of really following flow. We see that often in size, the true lumen becomes smaller, not all the time, becomes smaller than the false lumen. So this one expands very rapidly. The second is that. Um, you have pulsations, which is, this leads to systolic expansion because the LV traditionally is pumping still into the true lumen, and then that compresses the false lumen. The flow direction, again, because we still should have anti-grade flow in that true lumen because that is true to the LV. And then we have a false lumen, which would actually have anti-grade flow, reduced or absent flow. Sometimes it can have sort of retrograde flow. The communication of the flow would of course flow from the true to false lumen based on the pressure differential. And then the contrast and echo, similar uh, analogous to our above findings, should be early and fast in the true lumen and then slow and delayed into that false, uh, into that false lumen in the same uh, pattern that uh, the rest of the blood flows and assessed uh, both with the flow direction, the communication flow and the pulsation. Uh, these are just still images from echo, again, showing dissection can appreciate on Doppler and looking at those uh, criteria that we just uh, reviewed in terms of determining um, what we need to evaluate in terms of if we have a fine dissection on transesophageal or transthoracic study, and then evaluating again what the difference between the true and false lumen, and that can be really be helpful in terms of uh, the next steps in terms of uh, surgical intervention, or uh, in some cases, if it's just a type B dissection for medical management. Uh, this is a bit of a tougher question, uh, but one that does come up often uh, on exams. If one can list the five potential causes of aortic regurgitation secondary to acute type A aortic dissection. Uh, if anybody wants to volunteer or you can type in the chat uh, either or, and then I'll bring up a table with the, with the answers. For me, uh, learning this, there we go. And it was disruption. Eric, driver. thanks, Patrick. Yeah, so we got mechanisms of AR and type A dissection. So there's five things, and I think they kind of go se sequential in some ways. So once we get a dilatation of the aortic root, this can lead to incomplete aortic leaflet co optation. We sort of saw that in that for one of those other questions that I shared of that short axis a view of the uh, aortic root, uh, the aortic annulus, excuse me. Because of that, we some, and then secondary, if we have a type A dissection, we can get a cusp prolapse as there's asymmetric dissection depressing those cusps below the annulus. Uh, 
in a similar fashion, this can then lead to disruption of the aortic annulus, uh, support resulting in a flail leaflet. Or there can be issues in terms of invagination of the dissection flap through the aorta in diastole. So all very, very similar, we have dilatation of the aortic root. We can then have cusp prolapse from uh, disruption of the aortic uh, annulus or invagination prolapse of a dissection flap uh, in diastole. So all very similar, uh, but they all have slightly different types of mechanisms. And the last but not least, of course, thinking that anybody has pre-existing aortic valve disease, including bicuspid aortic valve, can definitely develop AR uh, because they're also at high risk of dissection. Um, not going into details in terms of, you know, the actual images to, to show you, unfortunately, but just keeping in mind, of course, we always have a differential anytime we're assessing things, both diagnostically through imaging or, or clinically. And here we need to, because we're, we're trying to rule out a, a life-threatening condition of aortic uh, syndrome, we also, there's benign, more benign or chronic uh, concerns that we always might find uh, when it comes both on our echo or, or CT images, but just to be aware of when we have the uh, differential that we may come across atheromas plaque as we discussed with atherosclerosis. Somebody might have prior surgery uh, and they might have uh, grafts and such. They may have um, reverberation artifact, traditionally just seen on TEE. And there's other things such as the innominate vein uh, and pericardial recess or aortitis that, that may be mimics. Um, hopefully this clip shows up well. It's the zoomed in ver version of a, from a transesophageal echo. But what finding is demonstrated in this clip? Yeah, Patrick, I think more or less nailed it. So this is a... Uh, Training ulcer. Yeah, with it with the mobile arthroma. So this is um, let's skip to the next. This is a penetrating uh, aortic ulcer uh, with a, a arthroma that's that's become mobile. So in addition to aortic dissections, other things that we can find. In fact, one of the patients in CCU who was admitted actually had an intramural hematoma with penetrating ulcer which then started to dissect and is now going to the OR today. Um, imaging features of this, this is very focal. Uh, so you have very focal aortic wall thickening, uh, as you can see on the diagram on the right. It's crescent shape, it's concentric, almost kind of you think about like a layered LV thrombus uh, because it's uh, within the wall. You get preserved luminal space, as you can see in the image to the right as well. There's still a good true lumen and it's more outward expansion. We don't have the dissection flap or false lumen as we see in other images from earlier. We talked about the aortic dissection. And there's oftentimes an echolucent region that can be uh, present within the aortic wall and you can kind of see the borders of everything. Sometimes you see a lot of calcification and, and intimal calcium that also can help to delineate, especially on echo where it becomes, uh, it becomes whiter. When we have penetrating uh, ulcers, uh, we can see that when there's, and especially in A or B, where you're developing that same kind of crescent intramural hematoma uh, that then kind of shows intimal uh, calcification and tear and kind of penetration. Just a brief overview uh, on coarctation. Uh, again, CT is now a modality that's often used for this. And there's a number of uh, key points to go through. I'm not gonna go in full details, but essentially we do screen for this when we do the um, views to look at the ascending aorta, particularly of the arch, um, but oftentimes it's very limited in terms of the views that we get with the arch as well. We don't necessarily, might not necessarily get really good images to see coarctation, unfortunately on transthoracic uh, or maybe transesophageal echo, but it's keeping in mind that often what we see is actually Doppler gradient changes. And, and these can be characteristic um, uh, sorry, this question, Mariana, in terms of not usually. Sometimes, if, you're, if maybe if you get a really good uh, image of an ascending aorta on like a short axis, on, on a long axis, but uh, just because we're much, it's a posterior structure uh, and much uh, further from the transthoracic probe on the chest compared to a TEE where we're, we're adjacent to the aorta, uh, 
and we get a better picture of the intima, we usually wouldn't pick up uh, an intramural um, uh, hematoma. And usually they don't really develop on the uh, aortic loop themselves. It's usually on the arch or descending thoracic aorta. But good question. Uh, just in terms of coarctation, yeah, we don't see it, but we usually can use Doppler to try to uh, uh, assess for this. And then that can further lead to uh, further imaging modality uh, to assess. This is just the characteristic findings of the diastolic tail that can develop with patients who have, we'll say, uh, traditional uh, aortic coarctation. Um, there's distal subclavian, uh, where we have kind of blunted systolic uh, aortic flow with a kind of an ongoing diastolic uh, slow running flow as well. Okay, now our last learning objective in the last 15 minutes, we're just going to describe the guidelines for follow-up monitoring of thoracic aortic disease. I think this is pretty important. Uh, I don't have as many echo images for, for this learning objective, but the fact is once we do identify that they have somebody with aortic disease, oftentimes we're also the uh, ones responsible for following up with these patients and referring them for surgery. And so keeping in mind that sometimes even in our reports, it might be uh, relevant to compare and understand um, what the growth and changes and to alert the treating physician uh, of, this, of this change. So first we just got a question. So you have a patient who was instantly found to have a dilated uh, aortic root on um, PTE for atypical chest pain. And you determine that uh, the dilated aortic root is not syndromic and not hereditary or genetic. So this would just be called the sporadic uh, dilated aortic root. And how would you, how soon would you repeat the uh, follow-up thoracic study? Now, this is, might be a little subjective, uh, but just from the information given uh, and, and the rough uh, timelines outlined, B, yeah, Ryan, you're right. It, it, is, it really does depend how big it is, uh, but traditionally, even in the guidelines, they say kind of, if, if you discover it the first time, uh, you should probably uh, reassess in six to 12 months. Uh, they give a duration of actually six to 24 months uh, for repeat, again, depending on the size, the patient's risk factors uh, and such. Uh, and again, I kind of provide some details that this is a sporadic, it's not syndromic, it's not hereditary, it's not genetic, um, but usually within six to 12 months, uh, if, you, if this is picked up for the first time to try to get a sense of the baseline and maybe rate of growth. And then from there it can, can go forward. And usually it's every year after that. Uh, when it comes to thinking about aortic root uh, and ascending aortic root aneurysms, what we're most concerned about, um, it's kind of putting them in different buckets. And this is how the guidelines differentiate things in terms of how people are surveilled, how they're managed both medically um, and worked up, and then how they're managed and referred surgically. So the first is a sporadic, um, and that's where there's no family history of aortopathy. There's no identifiable syndrome, such as Marfan. And if in this case, this person was sent for genetic testing. They don't have any known genetic variants. Other times there's this hereditary with a positive family history, but no identified syndrome or genetics that has a different category. Then there's also patients who have a syndrome or they're found to have a genetic variant that's non-syndromic. They have a set bucket of, of in terms of uh, monitoring and follow-up. And then there's patients with bicuspid aortic valve, which are probably most commonly as the probably this, uh, this one here and this one here. So when it comes to sporadic uh, aortic dilatation uh, and aneurysm, the class one, um, again, as we already know, is that patients will get a follow-up by transthoracic echo as the di uh, diagnostic uh, test of choice. Uh, this, again, to really assess the valve anatomy of the aortic valve, look at the valve function, look at the LV function, and other thoracic aortic diameters if, they, if they're found. Often, if you do see that as large, it is reasonable. Well, probably patients should go for, for chest imaging either by CT or MRI at least once. And then follow up every six to 12 months um, is reasonable for the first follow up. And then thereafter, depending on the stability and the size, uh, every six to 24 months. It's good to also try to choose the same modality of imaging to ensure that you get a good uh, replicability uh, and comparison as the rate of growth is really a determination in terms of where patients. Uh, at both size, absolute size, but also rate of growth um, in terms of the patients who get referred to for surgery. Um, now, who gets surgery in these in this category? Uh, so these are the class one indications. So it's patients who end up with an aneurysm, so that's greater than number than 
Um, and if they have bad symptoms, it doesn't really specify what that really means. Um, but if they're very symptomatic from it, this might be acute chest pain or, or, or other concerns. Uh, but for our purposes, usually it's by size because we're in the echo lab. And so if you have somebody who has sporadic uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm and it's greater than 5.5 mil, uh, centimeters, surgery is then indicated. If it's less than 5.5, and we'll say uh, it's, it's five or greater, or even 4.5 or greater, but it's demonstrating growth of over 0.3 centimeters in two consecutive years. So that means, say, if it was four centimeters uh, in, in year 2000, in 2020, and then it was in 2021, it was then 4.3, and then in 2022, it was 4.6. That's two years where you have at least 0.3 centimeters of growth. That would be an indication to refer somebody for surgery. Or if in one year, so we saw somebody last year, it's now from four now to 4.5, or if now it's 4.7, that would also be an indication for surgery. And that's again, why these measurements and standardizations are so important uh, that get, we get these right, because that can have really affect both patients' risk for rupture, but also their, um, their workup and outcomes. Uh, another very common population that we see is by cuspid um, aortic valves. And again, because, you know, the, at least 10% of these patients are really associated with a dilated uh, or with aortopathy. These are the main class one indications uh, for assessment. Again, with echo, CT um, or MRI, kind of further assess the rest of the chest and vessels and, and branches. Sometimes they do even recommend with these patients being worked up to make sure they don't have phenotypes for certain genetic uh, syndromes or even having genetics evaluation. And then uh, follow up, and again, always in a standard fashion, following the same types of uh, protocols on repeat, because that will provide the uh, best in terms of really following uh, them up with, with uh, the same types of studies. When it comes to the surveillance uh, and referral, these patients have smaller aorta uh, aneurysm sizes. And so in the case where it's actually just a dilated aorta of greater than four centimeters, we want to be able to, to monitor these patients for life. And we don't want them lost to follow up. When it comes to intervention, it's actually similar to sporadic patients. Anything greater than 5.5, that's an indication for surgery and the only class one indication. We then see that instead of using the body surface area, we're using that um, sur uh, sectional area to height ratio of greater than 10, and that would be an indication for surgery. And then for patients that have less than 5.5, but it's kind of getting just over five, if they're in a very high volume center, it's also reasonable to, to do. Um, if they're going uh, with other risk factors, which we won't really get into, but if it's between five and 5.4 with lots of other risk factors are showing increase in size intervally. And then if they're going for aortic valve repair or replacement, it's greater than 4.5. Uh, so a diagnosis of an aneurysm, then that should be replaced. Um, so you have a patient with Marfan syndrome who you are following for a, a thoracic aortic aneurysm, which has been stable for three years. What size of this aneurysm should you plan to refer this patient for surgery? So I talked about sporadic and I talked about bicuspid valve. Both technically the class one indications were greater than 5.5. In this case, this is Marfan's, which is syndromic, and it's the most common syndrome associated with these uh, thoracic aneurysms. We've got a lot of Bs and Cs. All right. So the answer is actually C for patients with Marfan. So this would be the class one indication. So again, 5.5 for sporadic or bicuspid. Five is for Marfan, so half centimeter or less. Um, Again, just to go through an order, just the surveillance, again, same process, TTE. Again, they say because it's syndromic six months later for your first one, and then after that, you can base it, usually do it annually, or depending on the rate of growth or, or other concerns. And usually around when this first study is, is diagnosed on transthoracic echo, we then get a CT or MRI uh, is recommended as well. When it comes to intervention, greater than five is our class one indication. And then things that are just slightly, you know, half a centimeter smaller, so greater than 4.5, but they have other risk factors that includes, you know, rate of growth, maybe they have intramural hematoma, um, and there's another long other things uh, listed uh, in the guidelines. Again, it comes back to that uh, 
cross-sectional area to height ratio of over 10 is the other two-way recommendation, similar to what we saw for bicuspid valve. Um, and that's, uh, that's for Marfan syndrome. Now, um, just briefly, not gonna get into too much detail, there's also non syndromic heritable. So these are people who don't have syndromes like Marfan, uh, but they are found to have genetic conditions. And now genetic screening is actually starting to be recommended for anybody that has a family history of aortic aneurysm and is found to have a diagnosis of aortic aneurysm. Um, and this just discusses the fact that they, they do the testing for this. We look at things and it's usually over five centimeters. So this non-syndromic heritable is treated just like Marfan syndrome. So anything basically with genetics, just like Marfan's would, uh, is treated with a, with a threshold of five for the class one indication for surgery. Uh, very rare kind of syndromes, all these deeds is associated with thoracic aneurysms um, with routine follow-up, probably more at higher tertiary centers or, or congenital centers uh, with respect to this. Um, this is just more for more information. And then Turner syndrome would be the other typical syndrome that is associated with thoracic uh, aneurysms. And that, yes, they also need routine follow-up because these patients are a bit smaller and they're shorter the height ratio doesn't actually work. And so this is actually the one circumstance where they do recommend body surface area is more accurate than the cross-sectional height uh, to, uh, excuse me, the cross-sectional area to height uh, as the indication. Just a summary, again, sporadic and bicuspid valve are very similar. Class one indications is greater than or equal to 5.5 centimeters or greater than 10 centimeters squared per meter uh, if you index it. Uh, if there's risk factors for growth, anything greater than five centimeters. And if you're going for an aortic valve replacement, it's 4.5 for bicuspid. The non syndromic heritable, just because it has a genetic component to it, will be treated the same as other genetic syndromes. And so that's a greater than five centimeters, or again, greater than 10 centimeters squared per meter. And again, greater than 4.5, so half, half a centimeter less with risk factors. Uh, that kind of summarizes. Uh, everything there. And those are, again, my learning objectives. I hope I was able to go through those thoroughly with you uh, in the hour that I had with everybody and try to do the best uh, over Zoom and, and post-call. Um, again, references that I went through from the major guidelines. And if anybody has any questions, happy to discuss further uh, for the last couple of minutes. Thank you so much. And especially uh, when you're post-call. So uh, well done. And um, uh, just a, just a, comments about these uh, American guidelines when I talk to my colleagues who are uh, involved in them. Uh, you notice the follow-up um, numbers are actually quite wide in terms of um, the intervals. Mm -hmm. It's because of medical legal. So they, they just want to make sure that they cover all the aspects. So, you know, some, some of that are, yeah. So you see that, you know, the range is actually quite wide. And, you know, in, in Canada, most of us would do, um, you know, 12 months when you find it dilated or aneurysm. And then, you know, when it's stable, uh, especially on the smaller size, we would tend to do it uh, every tw uh, 24 months afterwards. Um, and, and then, you know, if it's bigger, then, you know, we tend to follow them uh, closer. Uh, but, you know, we don't have a lot of data around this, interestingly, despite, you know, there are tons and tons of people have this problem. So, again, you know, it's a very fruitful area of research in terms of, you know, how often we should follow these patients. And um, excellent. Uh, any other comments from my colleagues? And very well done. And, very comprehensive. Um, Noah, yeah, it's Kim. Um, yeah, great rounds. Well done. Um, thanks again for doing it. Uh, yeah, I've done two rounds this week. So uh, yeah. it's, it's duly noted. Um, the only comment I was going to make was with the Mar fans. Uh, the absolute values I would just um, ask everyone to be a little bit careful of because we've all had patients who have um, who've had dissections at lower rates. So I mm -hmm. really take into account the family history and if if someone, you know, if there's a family uh, member who's dissected and often you can get the data, they may not always stick to that five centimeter rate. So yes, there's the absolute cutoff, but if there's a really strong family history, then um, we often send them to Mark and uh, Peterson and, and th they'll operate at a much lower limit than the standard five. So, you know, it's yeah. just one of those things, the good old clinical uh, correlates with the family history is super important because we obviously just don't all understand all the forces that might lead to the section in the Marfan cohort. And we're way more aggressive with Louis Dietz. So yeah. um, the, the follow-up is extremely important. And anyone who you're concerned about that, obviously we've got the inherited aortic clinic at St. Mike's. Um, 
and uh, Sam Afonso will get that genetic testing done very, very rapidly. You know, we've had cases where people have been pregnant and then will operate at much, much, much lower thresholds. And again, it's that sort of combination of the family history and the absolute, uh, the absolute number that will drive it. Now, these are rare, of course, but if you're concerned, you know, either you can send it to us here or go to the Toronto General and Sinai and, uh, you know, we can get the genetic testing done now with some of these kits within two to three week turnaround. So if you think you've got a pregnant patient or something like that, it's not the usual six to 12 months. So just uh, just remember that. And uh, and that will because obviously that might change the management strategy. Yeah. Yeah, those are really good points. Thanks for bringing that up. I had just initially just include the class one, which, you know, we use yeah. just absolute numbers. But even I was going to make the caveat when they base the studies in terms of why we even pick those absolute numbers, that's very much just on, you know, retrospective relative risk yeah. data. And they even mentioned that even with that, a lot of people rupture much earlier. Um, and we just haven't been able to really quantify or characterize that well enough. You know, we're starting to see a few things in terms of how intimal uh, damage over time maybe is maybe a little bit more longitudinal than it is in diameter uh, in, in subtle ways. Um, but we're still trying to actually find what increases somebody's risk for dissection rather than the actual uh, absolute value, which is actually not that relevant. It's just, we've kind of picked these numbers. They've been shown to be worse. And uh, yes, definitely being aggressive. And they also list a lot in the guidelines, like multidisciplinary teams. And yeah. if you have high volume aortic centers that they get referred to, and then they can operate at much, much lower thresholds, and especially if there's going to be a valve sparing procedure. Yep, yep. That's well, a really, really good point. I think there was just another... Uh, Comment in the chat. I'm not sure what happened today. Here's the chat. How important are the Z and index reporting the aorta side from absolute value? Um, so again, I we do it. Um, I think it helps for patients who have a larger body surface area of at least greater than two or who are very small. And again, we even they're more encouraging now to do the cross-sectional uh, area divided by the height, as that seems to be a better predictor of patients who are at more higher risk for rupture of that greater than 10 than it is in the index itself. 